So I'm very pleased to be here today in Northampton uh, in this Wolfram uh, uh, Disease uh, Day uh, because I think that we must collaborate between all teams in Europe and in the world which are involved in understanding and fighting against the disease of uh, Wolfram. So I'm not an MD, I am a scientist, so I'm going to present you today uh, what we are doing in my laboratory in Montpellier. So this laboratory is uh, uh, in the Institut des Neurosciences Montpellier, so Neuroscience Institute of Montpellier. It is an uh, institute which is 100% devoted to neurosensorial disease. So it means sight, hearing, and mostly also uh, um, proprioception, synesthesia, pain, and so on. Uh, on, our institute is located in a, a Montpellier hospital, university hospital, so it means that we have extremely good and tight relationship with the MDs um, uh, seeing, seeing the patients. So, uh, my, my, my group, my, my work is completely devoted to the problem of sight. We, have, uh, we are a national reference center in Montpellier to recruit patients with low vision or uh, legally blind. We have now more than 200, 500 patients that went through our service and among them 10% have optic neuropathies. So it means that they don't have retinal disease, they don't have eye disease, but they have a disease affecting the optic nerve which links the retina, which means the vision to the brain. So it is like a cable in between your eye and your brain, and this is affected, and this is very severely affected in the Wolfram syndrome. So, I would like to tell you the story how we came to uh, work on the Wolfram syndrome. In the year 2000, uh, we identified the most frequently mutated gene responsible for inherited optic neuropathy. And since that moment, this OK1 gene, it's another gene, since that moment we have been focusing much of our efforts to understand the pathophysiology, the mechanisms which are affected and leading to the degeneration of the optic nerve. It's affecting the optic nerve. And my boss, who is an ophthalmologist, told me we should focus our efforts also on the Wolfram syndrome because this is probably the most severe optic neuropathy, inherited optic neuropathy that we are facing in our cohorts of patients. So, what are we doing in our laboratory? We are working on three different topics. The first one, obviously, is to provide to the patients a clinical, a really good clinical diagnosis of the optic neuropathy. And associated to that, we try to provide a genetic diagnosis. It means that we are looking for the gene responsible for the disease of our patients, affecting our patients. So this is one aspect, and since maybe two years, we are routinely sequencing the WFS1 gene in our cohort. And I should say that now it is probably the second most frequently mutated gene responsible for inherited optic neuropathies. And not only for Wolfram syndrome. It means that some of our patients have mutation in WFS1 gene, have a very strong inherited optic neuropathy, but have no diabetes. Some others have inherited optic neuropathy and deafness, but no diabetes. Okay? So we are now involved in the screening of this gene in most of our patients because it is a really important gene for this type of disease. And if we are facing patients with low vision and low hearing, most probably it is linked to mutation in the WFS1 gene. So we provide a genetic diagnosis and this is also important for the patient, obviously, because if it is a recessive disease, the probability to transmit the disease to your, um, to your 
daughter or son is low, is very low, but if it is a dominant disease, in some cases you have dominant mutation, WFS1 gene, then you have 50% of chance to transmit the disease to your son or daughter. So this is one aspect which is obviously linked to the relationship we have with the, the clinics. The second aspect that we are developing is trying to understand the disease and trying to understand why the optic nerve is degenerating in Wolfram syndrome. And to do this, we have only one solution. It is to have a mouse model of the disease. So to get this mouse model, we need a, a, a mouse with mice <laughs> with two mutations in the WFS1 genes. And uh, you should know that to generate a mouse model with a mutation in one gene, the cost in, 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 in Europe, in France at least, is something like 50,000 euros to generate one mouse that you can breed afterwards without any problems. Generating just one mouse model, it's a very uh, uh, important cost. So we knew that uh, in the world, and in particular in Japan, there was a mouse model with a mutation in the WFS1 gene. So, thanks to Nolwen, who has been organizing in 2009 the first meeting and first workshop on Wolfram disease, I met the uh, investigator from Japan who owned this mouse model. I already asked him two years before, in 2007, if he would uh, be uh, so kind to send me the mouse model, and he said no. <laughs> but because he came to France, uh, we had this workshop, and then it's a two-day workshop. Between the first and second day, we had in general a very good supper. And, uh, some, uh, uh, and this time it was on, on, a, on a barge uh, on the same river. Okay, so we had a very good uh, evening, plenty of wine. And when we came back to the hotel. Uh, Really, I mean, I had the supper with uh, Yukio Tanizawa, and I was really enjoying and, and serving him a lot of wine, red wine. And when I was in the, in the bus coming back to the hotel, I told him, Yukio, now you have to send me your mouse model. He was working on the, on the aspect of diabetes, but not on the aspect of, uh, of uh, optic nerve. So, because of no one, because of this meeting, uh, he agreed to send me the mouse model. So this occurred in 2009, and since that, in, since that moment, we, we spent three years to breed the, this mouse model and then to analyze the vision of mouse. So we have now in our institute all the facilities to evaluate all the parameters of the vision of a mouse, exactly with the same criteria that are used for uh, the diagnosis of uh, low vision for uh, a human patient. And we spent three years to study this mouse model to finally reach the, the, the conclusion that uh, it, had, it had a very poor loss of vision. So it means between uh, mutated and controlled mice, we had a very faint difference in uh, the vision and we had a very low degeneration of the optic nerve. So we spent three years on this and at the end, now we take the mouse and we put it in the dustbin because it has no use for future uh, therapeutic trials. Since that moment, we had two additional uh, uh, meetings on Wolfram in Paris. And at that moment, I had the same process with another uh, investigator coming from uh, uh, Slovenia. <coughs> Estonia, sorry, Estonia, and uh, he had a second model, another model, different, with a different mutation in the WFS1 gene, and uh, we, we convinced him also to send this mouse model to our laboratory, and since that moment we are now working on this second mouse model because it, is, it has a much more severe phenotype than the first one that we get from Japan, okay? And we are now almost convinced that this model will be perfect for testing gene therapy, something that will be tried and that we will develop uh, in the next weeks, the next months. And we hope to have some uh, results, I don't say positive results, but at least results in 2014 to know if 
by acting a gene therapy, by injecting a vector with a WFS1, with a wild type WFS1 gene in a mouse model, we can rescue, we can prevent the degeneration of the protein. This is a very tricky uh, experimental procedure. It is very difficult because the size of the eye of a mouse is 500 times smaller than the eye of a human in a So it is extremely small. It, has, um, it requires um, the extreme precision in the, in the surgical manipulation of the eye. Uh, we, we can only inject 2 microliters, so it means uh, 500,000 uh, times of 1 liter. Uh, no, 1 in 500,000 of 1 liter, so it means really a minimal uh, amount and it's extremely tricky because the, 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 the structure of the mouse eye is, is quite different from, from the human being. So nevertheless, we are pretty uh, uh, excited about this. We, we, we think that this is a, a relevant uh, way to prevent the degeneration of the optic nerve in the Wolfram patients and maybe also for other patients with a mutation in the WFS1 gene. So the third aspect that we are dealing with is to understand inside the cells what's happening when you have mutation in the WFS1 gene. Okay? You have a phenotype between the genotype, the mutation, and the phenotype, the pathology, and the clinical symptoms. You have process inside cells which are not working. And we really want to know what's happening inside the cell when you don't have the WFS1 the active WFS1 protein. Okay? To perform that, we are using fibroblasts from patients. It means that in the in skin, with the skin biopsies, we can uh, generate fibroblasts which express the mutation and which show deficit associated to the lack of the WFS1 gene. It doesn't mean that your skin is sick, but we are able to analyze what's happening inside these cells and understand what is wrong, what is the mechanism which is not working properly inside these cells. So to do that, we are working with patient fibroblasts in laboratory, in team laboratory, and right now, because we know that these cells are not, they show the defect, but they are not affected. We want to work on cells which are affected in the body of the patients. Okay? And to do this, we have now started a collaboration with ISTEM, a big laboratory in Paris, to produce iPS cells. iPS cells are induced pluripotent cells. It means cells that are reprogrammed, let's say to zero, from which we can derive neurons that are affected in patients. Neurons from the optic nerve, neurons from the cochlea, neurons from the peripheral nerve system, and so on and so on. So we can work and we can assess the mechanisms which are affected directly in the neurons that are specifically affected in patients. And this is something which is very important to understand the specificity of the disease. And also, last point, very important one, using these iPS cells, we can produce sufficient amount of neurons to make a screening on pharmacological compounds. And this is another aspect that we are developing with the high stem at the moment. It's to perform, to try uh, to find good parameters on which we can assess the therapeutic benefit using a um, library of components of products that could eventually lead to a drug that would um, benefit to all the organs of the uh, patients. It means it's not something which is specific to the vision, but it would be good for the vision, it would be good for the audition, it would be good for the pancreas, and so on. So we are working on this aspect, and we expect that in the next years, we will iso isolate or identify some drugs that would be active on the defect associated to the WFS1. So all this work 
is uh, all this investment is obviously something quite important in, in my laboratory. The work is performed by Delphine Bonnet, Cécile Delettre, and Nesrine Ben Kafadar. There are three persons working 100% of their time on the Wolfram disease, plus additional technicians dealing with the mouse model because you have to reproduce, you have to feed them, you have to breed them, you have to uh, genotype them, and so on. So it's quite a, a heavy work uh, to work with, uh, with the mice, also quite expensive. We have local co collaboration with Jérémy Fauconnier and Alain on calcium transfer uh, in, in, in cells. We have uh, three uh, MD working on, on, on uh, Wolfram disease in the clinics. So Christian Amel, the head of the group, uh, Agathe Roberti, a uh, neuropediatre, and Isabelle Meunier, a neuroophthalmologist. Then we have also uh, important collaboration, and this is very important because alone we will never be successful with Marc Pechanski from uh, Eastern in Paris, Dan Milea, who is a neuroftalmologue in Angers, providing he has probably the, the, the most patient with the Wolfram syndrome, and we are working now on the characterization of the visual defect in Wolfram patients. Yukio Tanizawa and Sudev Cox, who provided our laboratory with the mouse model with WFS1 mutation. And obviously, I want I want to thank the, the, the families because they are contributing to clinical studies, they are contributing to providing uh, uh, biological samples and so on and so on. And many, many uh, associations in France, of blind associations like Inadef et Ina France, uh, who are dealing with uh, blind patients, IFM who is dealing with gene therapy uh, in France, quite powerful association, and also obviously. Uh, uh, the Association Centre de Wolfram, which is, which is headed by Lerwen Lefleur, and, and I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be very pleased to answer to them. I think you must be feeding all these mice on good French wine and cheese, <laughs> and that's why they're doing so well. Because you know that drinking alcohol is not good for your technology. Okay. <laughs> okay. No smoking. Okay. Okay. I'm sure somebody might like to ask a, 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 a question. How does it differ from stem cell research? So you're using genes, but how does it differ from injecting stem cells into the eyes? So, you, you, her question is, can we inject stem cells in the eye to repair the optic nerve? Um, I, I should say that right now, with the knowledge that we have, it is quite a difficult uh, strategy that she's proposing. Because you should know that the optic nerve is connecting the retina to the brain. It is a, a three inches long uh, trajet. So it means that you have to inject cells in the retina that will differentiate and that will emit the cable along the optic nerve and reaching the good target in the brain. And this is something that we, right now, we do not control. We, we are not able to do that uh, for the moment. I don't know, maybe in 10 or 15 years it will be possible. But targeting the axon, the growth of the axon from the retina to the middle of the brain is something which is, to my knowledge, not accessible right now. It would be a retinal disease, it means photoreceptors affected or any other type of uh, cells in the retina, it would be possible because you just have to inject in the retina, then cells have to differentiate and they can have you know, connections in the close related cell, with the close related cells. But in this case, you have between the retina and the brain, you have a big cable in which you have 1.2 million small cables inside. Okay? So it means that you have 1.2 million axons which are driving the information from the retina to the brain. And they do that 15 times per second. So it's sometimes like 20 megabyte information which are connected between the retina and your brain. 60% of the information arriving to your brain. And right now, 
I think it is quite complicated to, uh, to, uh, to uh, bet on this strategy. We can either propose gene therapy to prevent or to slow down the evolution of the disease, but this is specific of retinal ganglion cell, this is specific of the optic nerve, or we are also looking for more general so the solution means taking a pill, and this would uh, slow down the evolution of the disease for all the cells. Yes? Please. It's not to actually repair any damage. I mean, repairing a nerve for the moment is really a big deal, a big challenge. Uh, we, we, we expect that we can slow down or even stop, it would be the best, the evolution of the disease. But in repairing right now, it's quite, quite difficult. I mean, at least uh, we, don't, we don't see any, any relevant strategies that would allow to do that with our actual knowledge on neuroscience. On neuroscience. Or who are? You never know. What sort of, you know, if you were a betting man, which you might be, I don't... As a scientist, I am always betting. Okay, fine. <laughs> what sort of, you know, timescales might you, do you think there might be? You know, is it, you have no idea or... You know, I, I tried long? to tell you a very simple story. Okay. I have no much time, but it is really highly difficult. Yeah. Because right now, when we, we are using control vectors, to micro-inject in the, in the eye of mouse models, okay? And for the moment, we are not able to reach more than 25% of the cells that should be infected by the virus. So either if we are limited by the infectious, infectiosity, the, the level of infection of the vectors that we are, we are uh, using, so it means that we have to prepare again the vector, so this has a cost, cost 5,000 euros to prepare the vectors with a high titer. It means that then we have to repeat the experiments with another mouse. When you inject you know, in the eye, you have to wait two months for the, the transgene to be expressed. Okay, and then you have to isolate the eye, you have to uh, do immunofluorescence, a lot of microscopy, a lot of counting, and so on and so on. So, it's, it's far from being something easy, yeah. as easy as I told you. All right. <laughs> okay? But, for example, the, the, I have a, a, a technician who is really specialized in, in micro-injection in the mouse model. She's training for one week before starting the real experiments. Because it is so delicate to micro-inject in something which is so small, and she's doing that without any support just by hand, okay? Uh, so it, it's, it's really very, very difficult condition and, and we want to go, let's say, in a slow way but in a very secure way to control things that we are doing. Some people will tell you in two years it will be finished. I will never say that, okay? I hope we will have good results in 2014 and then you know that from preclinical studies to clinical studies it is a very long way and a very expensive way also because for producing one vector that will be injected in human beings this has a cost of 500,000 euros just for the vector okay so we have to find the money we have then to check on, on, on monkeys if it is toxic or not this has also a very important cost before we can expect to go to human beings so it's a long process it's great to have the closest relationship, to put our efforts together and not repeat twice what should be done once and what we can you know, share as much as we can. Okay. Oh, wow. Yes? Yeah. It sounds like there are two parts to the process that you're working on. Uh, one is the delivery of the drug, and one is the drug itself, the development of the drug itself. In, in, in the sense, are they are they both are they so hand in hand that they're the same distance along the road, or do you feel that that there's one part of those two things which is further than the other? 
delivering the treatment is a very important question. If you, if you think about gene therapy, then you have to deliver a part, a bit of DNA to retinal ganglion cells in the eye. So to do that, we are using um, uh, adenovirus associated vectors. So it means that they are um, virus that are routinely affecting us every day, but from which we have taken out, not me, but people working on vectorology, taken out the viral particle and the, the part of the virus which is, which is dangerous for health, and we are just using the capsid, the surrounding of the virus, to infect cells and providing the therapeutic DNA. So this is something which works pretty well, although right now, for the moment, in the mouse model, we do not reach more than 25% of all the cells that we would like to infect. Okay? But we can expect to reach higher level. So this is one aspect. Now, if you, if you, if you consider uh, delivering a drug, pharmacological drug, we don't know what will be the molecule that we are going to identify, but we will have to consider probably in collaboration with uh, persons which are, who are specialized in, in, in drug delivery, uh, if you take it by just by mouth, or if you have to inject them in the eye, or in the, in the ear, in the cochlea, or, but I would guess it would be by mouth. I would bet on this. And then it should slow down the degenerative process in the whole body, not specifically in the eye or in the Okay. So I'm, I'm staying until 2 o'clock this afternoon, so if you have any questions, please do not hesitate. I will be very happy to answer. Okay, thank you so much.